Hey golfers and welcome back to the Second Swing Thoughts podcast and uh, I'm Drew Mahold and I'm joined today by Mike Viviano and we're actually down here at the tour van at Scottsdale, our Scottsdale store. So I think this is the first ever podcast episode that we have recorded in the tour van at Scottsdale. So um, we have a very special guest with us in Mike because Mike's got a very extensive background. Um, you know what, Mike, I'll actually just let you do the introduction for yourself and uh, tell the viewers and listeners, you know, where you've been and what you've done. Okay. Well, I am Mike Viviano. I am at the Scottsdale store here in Scottsdale. Uh, it's an absolute honor to be here. Um, prior to coming to S Second Swing, uh, I ran the Bettinardi Golf Studio for five years out in Chicago, which was putters, milling, uh, one of a kind, really unique pieces at Bettinardi Golf. Prior to that, I worked on the PGA Tour for about 25 years, working for Royal Precision and Callaway Golf. Um, Absolutely wonderful experience. Uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, I was very lucky. I fit 27 people that won majors and, wow. you know, probably another 100 people that won tournaments. So, in a way, you've got more majors than Jack and Tiger. In a way. In a way, I do. You've, you've, you've <laughs> you have contributed to more majors. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Combined effort with yeah, multiple right. people. Right, but, right. Uh, you know, really. Uh, I couldn't ask for anything more as a, as a fitter, someone that did design development work, mm -hmm. what better place to do your work on is on the PGA tour. Right. Right. And, and so what you do now here at second swing, you kind of, it's more of an emphasis on putter fittings, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I love the full bag. Um, you know, the last probably eight years I've really gotten involved into the putting realm of the game. And I feel this is the easiest way, to help people become a better golfer. Mm -hmm. If you think about the one club we use on every hole, it's our putter. Um, if you are fit properly, um, yep. you can definitely shave some strokes and then it just revolves into the rest of the clubs. Because mm -hmm. if you putt well, everything else is easier. Yeah, yeah, and actually it's funny, right before we started recording this off air, we were, you showed me an example of a you know tour pro you're working with now and just a simple change that you made to his putter yep. and all of a sudden you, you watch the, you know, the replay of his putting stroke and the delivery of the putter. And it's just the, the putter sitting a little bit better on the ground at a dress changed everything. So yeah. simple things like that, like it, for you, it might seem very simple what a change might be, but for the golfer out there listening, they might think like it's really complicated. And a lot that is, that is exactly why fittings in general are so important. Uh, the video I showed you was a, a video of Aaron Badley. Mm -hmm. You know, probably one of the top five putters in the world. The, I mean, he can roll the rock. Even the best players at one point in their career will get a golf club that doesn't fit them perfectly. This putter was about three degrees out of whack. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it got bent in traveling, maybe he leaned on it. Somewhere it got tweaked where... You know, I said to Aaron, I go, you know, what seems to be going on? And it's like, well, I feel like I'm push blocking everything. And, you know, it's one of those things where once you start going through the process, looking at the setup, seeing what the putter's doing, that had push block written all over it because that putter was aimed left. Yeah. Now, even these guys are incredible at tweaking things, it. Yeah. manipulating it. You know, but I said to Aaron, I go, you know, over the course of the year, how many three footers have you missed? And he goes more than normal. So we did the tweak. Um, I told him next time you go to the golf course, just hit, just hit some three footers till you're blue in the face. Lo and behold, the next day he calls me up and he's like, Biv, you know, just hit three footers for about two hours. I haven't missed. And I go, well, I think you won. I think it'd take me about three minutes to miss. Actually, probably less than that. And you know, two hours without missing. You, you, is a, you get the right yeah. setup. You'd be surprised how good you can get. <laughs> right, right. That, that's probably the most rewarding thing for you, probably, is whether it is Aaron Baddeley, a tour pro, or whether it's someone that's just starting golf. Like the 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 feedback the, from them. When the great thing about golf is 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 when the customer comes back, whether it's a tour player or you know the guy who claims he's the world's worst putter, when they come back and they're like excited because mm -hmm. they had their best round. That's the ultimate. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate for me, even after doing this for 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I know you're not the only fitter that's told me that too. I think that's sort of a common theme among our team here is that's 
that's the number one rewarding thing is yeah, you know the... that that feedback from them. So um, we've alluded to it a little bit, but let's kind of turn the clock back a sure. little bit to your career, um, starting in golf shafts actually. Yeah. So you started with golf shafts. Um, how did you get into that and start there? Uh, you know, I was working in upstate New York where I was born and raised uh, for a small custom golf club company where I was doing a lot of purchasing with True Temper Sports, uh, Royal Precision, but back then it was called Brunswick. And um, out of the blue one day, um, Kim Braley called me up, who was uh, the director of design at, at Brunswick back in the day. And he goes, you know, 27 years old, you're young. How'd you like to go on the PGA Tour? I'm like, uh, where do I sign up for this gig? <laughs> he goes, well, you're going to have to drive the tour van to site to site. You know, you're going to be living out of a hotel, uh, but you get to follow the tour. Well, I instantly said yes, mm -hmm. jumped on board, and it was absolutely incredible. Um, my first tournament I worked was the PGA at Valhalla. Okay. And um, I got the van all set up, and I'm in there, and in comes this, the first person. Rocco Mediate. He goes, yeah. who are you? I go, I'm Mike Viviano. He goes, you Italian? I go, I'm Italian. He goes, <laughs> want to go out to dinner tonight? That's where that relationship started. Yeah, yeah. Rocco, uh, one of my dearest friends, um, an incredible uh, golfer. Uh, a lot of people don't realize here's a person who's had back injuries, but yet he still continues to fight and win and be successful. Um, but he, he, here's a guy who just basically took me under his wing. We had dinner and, you know, he's had probably nine wins since then. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, just just awesome. Yeah, well, he's we've actually been lucky enough to work with him too on a couple of videos on our channel. Yep. Um, and he's been just excellent for us. And obviously um, even he spent some time in Minnesota with Larry Bobka up there too. I know those guys, um, we'll work together often, but um, that's cool. Like even kind of creating those relationships and the fact yeah. that he was able to help you out with that in your first week out there. Yeah, um, made me feel welcome right out of the gate. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we know him now. I, if you haven't followed Rocco on Instagram, he's got some really good yeah. stuff on there too. Yeah. So, um, but is kind of talk about working with Rocco over the years then and maybe um, how he may, maybe compares to like some of the other guys that you've worked with. Um, I mean, is he, I know he's very particular about his equipment. Um, he, he, he's, a, he's a little bit of a junkie, uh, mm -hmm. very detailed, um, but he's also one of these players that wants to know more and he understands when a shaft doesn't fit him, what does the ball do? Mm -hmm. You know, for really highly gifted people, when a shaft is a little weak, the ball tends to want to go to the right. Uh, overly too stiff, it goes a different direction. He's very dialed into his equipment where He's always had success because his equipment's always been perfect. Yeah. And what I mean by that is when you start diving into frequency numbers, he's a he's a 7.2 guy his whole career. Uh, even today, he still floats right around that stiffer than normal type material. Mm -hmm. But when you watch his ball flight, you watch the consistency, you see his distance control. Yeah. Um, it's impeccable. Um, I played quite a bit of golf with Rocco here in Scottsdale. I think the last three rounds I've played with him, he's on, he shoots under 67 yeah, religiously. I mean, it'd be good. nice to do that once yeah. in a while. You know, I, I'll never really know that feeling, I don't think. But uh, he's, he's, he's awesome. I mean, yeah. in, the, in the, the short time that we've been able to work with him, obviously that pales in comparison to the time you spent with him. But um, and then plus going back to, I mean, he's obviously, I think for maybe the casual player or a casual golf fan, he's most remembered for obviously the, the duel with Tiger yeah. um, uh, at the U.S. Open. But he has a pretty impressive resume outside of that, too. He's won a bunch, um, and now he's still kicking it on the PJ Tour yeah, champions. Yeah, and, and once again, I mean, people don't understand the, the extensive back surgeries he's had. I mean, most people, if they have it, they're not playing golf. Mm -hmm. Not only is he playing, he's competing, he's successful, and he's still doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it is really cool to watch him, and uh, we're always rooting for him too. Uh, so, how about some of the other players that you've that you've worked with in your career? I mean, I know you've, the the list goes on and on, uh, and, but like, who are some of the, the favorites that you had in your? I career mean, I'm going to be honest. With? I am a I'm still a big Greg Norman fan. Yeah. Uh, Greg Norman was a big um, 
precision guy. Yep. Had a, an incredible run. And then somewhere uh, he switched out of the product. Mm. And his game started to go down a little. He didn't win. His greens and regulations started slipping. His driving accuracy was slipping. And I, I'm saying to myself, now this is my first year on tour. I'm like, how am I going to get this guy mm -hmm. back? So I got to, to know his caddy, Tony Navarro. And, you know, I just go up to Tony and go, hey, how's the pay cut? And he goes, <laughs> what do you mean? I go, well, you missed the cut. I go, you switch your shafts, you missed the cut. So a couple weeks would go by and, you know, Greg's still struggling a little. And Tony, how's the pay cut? And <laughs> I think he got tired of me saying it because it was probably about a year, all of a sudden, someone taps me on the shoulder. I'm on the range in Memphis and uh, it's Greg Norman. Yeah. Might be the only time the back of the hair on my neck stood, stood up. Obviously I don't have any now, but uh, <laughs> it stood up and I was like, this is, this is cool. Yeah. And he goes, Mike, um, I understand Tony's taking a pay cut. I'm like, well, you haven't won in a year. He goes, that's fair. What should I do? I think we should put your your precision mm -hmm. 7.3 shafts back in the bag. So we put him in in Memphis, and he won that week. <laughs> That's and a, then he, talk about immediate results. He right won there. that week. He uh, I think he went to the World Series of Golf, which was in Akron, Ohio, the week after, and he won there too. So that's, that's it, unbelievable. It works. <laughs> it, it clearly. Or I mean, I'm lucky. <laughs> unreal. Well, yeah, that would be. But it's it's it can't be luck if, it, if stuff like that happens over and over in your career. Which when you, you know, when you about. once again when you're dealing with the best players in the world, they're good. Yeah. I mean, it's it's scary how good these guys are. Um, being on the range, listening, hit shots. It's a different sound. It's a different flight. Yeah. It's 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 pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, very, it's, very cool to watch and listen. And even like, you know, I've been, you know, fortunate enough to go out onto like driving range, say up into the Twin Cities or at the 3M Open, right? Sure. You go up there and you watch these guys and uh, the, the consistency of the ball flight over and over and over. And then, you know, they, to nowadays they've got, you know, their track man or whatever launch monitor they might have. Maybe some of them have multiple launch monitors out mm -hmm. there on the range. But back then, you know, there was like, like, so when you were trying to work with tour players, you know, Normans and, and, mediates at the I time mean, you know these guys how did you like work with them on so that because there was no numbers this, this to, is wild that. um that's that's an, such an awesome question we didn't even have range finders yeah yeah so phil, phil mickelson was the best at it he'd have bones walk off the range and put a towel down and he'd have a towel at 50 yards 60s whatever it is there might be 10 towels I'm one half of the driving range, and Phil's just hitting shots, learning how far he was hitting clubs. You know, we, we, we walked off a lot of things on the range. We'd put markers out there. We knew this was 150, 160, right. 170. And, okay, hit it that stake. I mean, we didn't, like I say, we yeah. didn't even have a range finder to shoot it. It was, you know, That's crazy. Thumb test I mean, or, today, you even, oh, a lot of you in, like, the driving ranges, you go out there, there's all these there's different targets out there and you just Technology take out a range finder, boom, unbelievable. you got a number. And then obviously if you have some sort of a launch monitor, which those are becoming an option for, you know, an affordable option now that yeah. you can have, you can bring out there on the range with you as an, a, maybe a casual, not competitive player and still get the numbers you want. Yep. But not even close to what you guys were doing back then, which is literally walking off all these numbers. I remember Hal Sutton came into Phoenix and Hal was another guy who I had an unbelievable relationship with. Uh, one of the finest ball strikers you'll ever see. And uh, when he came out to, to Phoenix, uh, we went out to TPC, and it was one of those things where I contacted the director of golf, Bill Grove, and I'm like, hey, I'm coming out with Hal. Mm -hmm. Going to use the back of the range. He's like, what do you need? I go, is there any way we can get pylon set up? And they, they, they walked him off, and I had a whole section of the range that was, you know, 10-yard yeah. increments with pylons. And that's what we used to do. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating because that's something that I know basically from this point on and maybe the last couple of years and on, that will be taken for granted is how easy it is to get your 
information about your game and the shots that you're hitting. Because back then, you, you know, if any casual player goes to the driving range 10, 15 years ago, even longer, don't have a range finder. Nope. You don't, and there's no launch monitors and, and you know, tour van bays or club fittings to get information from. You're just hitting shots and that, that feels good. That looks good. That's an old school method of fitting. And I'll tell you what, though, it is awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, when you eliminate the technology, now you're relying on the player to hit a shot and give you feedback. And you're relying on yourself to digest what is that ball doing? Is it spinning too much? Because now you could see the flight of the ball climbing yeah. and landing soft. You know, you can always get the guy who sort of crowns it a little bit where the ball goes out and falls out of the air. I mean, that's, that's the art of fitting is understanding right. what is the ball doing? How do you make it mm -hmm. fly better? Yeah, yeah, that's, and it remains that way too. It's just now there's all this information and it's, and I, I, and I imagine in, in your case and, and maybe club fitters out there that have worked over the last you know couple of decades where things have changed and there's all this information right away when it's, the shot is hit in the bay, it can almost be like almost too much you feel like sometimes. It, you almost question it because it's happening so quickly. <laughs> yeah. You know, you hit a shot into the screen and that ball's hitting the screen and oh, here's your launch, here's your spin, here's your total, <laughs> here's your distance. Like, how did it do that when it's still in the air? Yeah. Pretty yeah. good calculation. Right. I mean, TrackMan has given you guys, like, it's almost, you know, like I, it's a blessing and a curse in some ways. Um, and I think I've talked with Larry about that and he said something similar. You know, it's a lot of times he'll get like, He's worked with college players um, right now where they have all this information and sometimes it gets in their heads of, well, I need to hit the ball further, this is what I need. And then you know, Larry's kind of stance sometimes as the devil's advocate is, well, no, I mean, if you don't like the ball flight or you don't like how it feels, then why would you? I, I see it quite a bit um, when I use Quintech, which is a really great state-of-the-art mm -hmm. design development software teaching for putting where it will give you a launch angle, it will give you a forward backspin, it will give you a side spin. And, you know, I look at things a little differently because we don't want to confuse the player. If one number is great, which is the most important number, and then you have another number that maybe isn't perfect but not bad, yeah. there's always that one player trying to chase perfection. That's when yeah, true. The, mm -hmm. the technology can get a little mm -hmm. sideways. Yeah. Um, because we're not perfect. Yeah. And, you know, swinging a club, whether it's five, six miles an hour, or you're using a driver where you're generating 120, 25 miles an hour. Yeah. Some of these guys, it's just incredible. But I think because of the technology, it's people have learned how to swing the club faster. Yeah, you yeah, know. I, think, I, I, I think I would even say that that was, I'm one of those people that um, just now being a second swing for, you know, five years and, and watching club fittings and doing these videos and stuff, you kind of get a sense of how to swing and how to use the if, information yeah, and the technology. You, with, with great fitters that we have, mm -hmm. the education that we have, the technology that we have, you can you can pick up some speed relatively quickly. Yep. Yeah, there's there's and and hit it straight. Right, right. Yeah, there it's it has, it's it's wild. And then I mean, <laughs> back from in the '90s when you're using you know small I don't know what the, the the volume on those things was, but certainly not 460 like it is today. 280. Uh, a little different. A little different. <laughs> um, I I, I want to ask more about Phil because yeah. I know we've talked a little bit off air today as well about just how you know, fun it was for you to work with him. And the fact that he was almost, he has so much knowledge already and you, you've seen it like in media and stuff. He'll, you know, he's talked about his equipment before. I, the, the famous clip is the, uh, the clip when he was on Faraday a few years ago. And he talks about all these different elements that you have to consider on an, any golf shot. Um, but he's also the open book and wanting to learn more, trying new things to get better. And that, I know you've experienced that with him. I, w I was very lucky. Um, you know, once again, one of my first really good players to work with was Phil. Um, you know, living in Scottsdale, he was in Scottsdale. Uh, his management group was here in Scottsdale. Um, I was able to build a rapport and get access to him relatively quickly. Um, 
what was great about Phil is he'd, he'd pick up the phone and call you, you know, like, hey, Saturday, I'm free. You want me to hit something? He was fantastic at testing product, helping us develop products. But more importantly, he was using it to help develop his game and get it to a point where he can compete in majors. Um, you know, when I met Phil, he was with Yonix, which was a graphite mm -hmm. shaft company. I sort of, uh, you know, approached his manager in a, uh, a young 28 year robust fitter. Uh, I told him he'd never win a major. He looked at me like I had my head on crooked. Um, I think Phil missed the cut that week and I get the phone call on their way home. Phil's gonna be at the office. You got one chance to make this work. Lo and behold, Saturday morning, I'm waiting for Phil. We went through the whole process, what Royal Precision was all about with golf shafts. And um, by noon, we had a set route at the back of the range at Greyhawk and hitting balls, and he instantly bought into it. Wow. Um, it was right around the time where we were also developing Project X, which is a product that he was one of the first people to hit, put it in play, instantly had great success with it. Um, I think he won, you know, his first Masters was yep. with that, and it springboarded from there. Right. Right. Um, but he, he was a, he once again, back to your question, he was a guy that liked to try things. Mm -hmm. He was always looking for that edge. How do I maintain consistency? Maybe not have to work as hard because my equipment is so good. Right. It's, I, I appreciate your, how, you know, maybe forthright you were a few times back when you're young in your twenties, oh. you're out there, you were, you were telling Greg Norman's caddy, how's the, how's the pay cut? Yeah. And then you went to Phil's team and you said, he's not going to win a major and you know, it, uh, for you, it created these kind of cool relationships and opportunities for you. You know, co coming from companies that weren't necessarily the biggest, but you believed in the technology yeah. and what they were, you know, you had to figure out ways to get in there. Mm -hmm. You know, once we landed Phil, once we had Greg Norman back, uh, you had people like Rocco having success, Lee Jansen, two U.S. Opens. It made it very easy to approach other people mm -hmm. because those are the people that people watch what's he doing yeah if he's tinkering with something maybe i need to tinker with right, something. right right kind of adds a, a level of credibility yeah maybe absolutely and also helps grow these sort of these companies these brands that yep. you know uh, that you were working with and that's that's really that's a cool story of, of how that all came to fruition so um i kind of want to now almost take it from the tour to now second swing so you've over the years you went you were with callaway um, after the, the uh, Royal Precision, then you were at Betonardi for a little bit as well. So through all of that, you worked with a lot of the best players in the world. Now you spend a lot of time working with, you know, like golfers like myself, yep. uh, you know, average players. Um, you notice a big difference between the two? Like obviously the, the skill level is one thing, well, the, talent, but. The, the, um, obviously the tour player can pick up things quicker. Yeah. Uh, the neat thing with golfers we all have a passion to get better. Mm -hmm. We will try just about anything to yes. get better. Um, you know, from my years of experience on the tour, I have built a level of confidence that I have to where when I do work with regular players, I tone it down, give them the best information I can, use the technology that I have, mm -hmm. and I'm seeing fantastic results in making people better at playing golf from what I've done in the mm -hmm. past. And, you know, when you get that customer who comes in and goes, I am the world's worst putter, it's a challenge to make him better. I mean, I, I did have a person tell me that. I go, well, <laughs> how do you quantify being the world's worst putter? He goes, well, I've never had less than 40 putts. That's a lot. Now, I will That's say this, this individual was not the tallest person in the world. Uh, he had a standard 35 inch putter. When he addressed it, it looked like he was putting with his three wood. <laughs> you know, clearly, hey, can you, has anyone ever told you to get closer? He goes, yeah, all the time. I go, well, let's get closer. <laughs> well, his idea of closer was like an inch. Yeah. I'm like, all right, let's take a picture. Let's show you what you look like. And he was like, I knew I was bad, but I didn't think I was that bad. Yeah. The neat thing with the camera and the technology, you can get a person to get in a really good position instantly. Mm -hmm. Once you get them in that position, you get them a putter that now fits them, which in this guy's case might have been 
seven inches shorter. Wow, yeah. Now the putter sits pretty drastic flap. change, but well, he had this Cameron that was 35 inches, and we're not going to pick on Scotty, but he was wearing out the Scotty Cameron on the heel. The toe was up so high, <laughs> yeah. you know. Even even trying to break the ice with the gentleman, I said, "Have you ever whiffed?" He goes, "At least once a round." I mean, the toe was up so high, and he was so far away. Yeah. He literally swung over the ball if he wasn't careful. Yeah. So, and so and it's it's almost like, you know, I think to your point that you've uh, mentioned to me before and even in, in this uh, podcast is that, you know, the putter is the club that, you know, unless you chip in or hole out or something, you're going to use every every hole. You're going to so use it on that every hole. Is in, in many ways more important to get fit even than your irons and your driver than. Yeah, I mean, know, you know, I get, other club. they come in all the time and it's like, OK, I, I like putting, but I'm not great. And it's, if we can eliminate one three putt around, then it turns into two. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden that person goes from 35 putts to 30 and maybe they get into the 28 range. You want to see someone get excited about golf. That's, that's it. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just rolling the ball, rolling it straight versus mm -hmm. manipulating. Yeah. Yeah. I think. That's maybe almost a, a I want to say a misperception, but I think a lot of golfers think club fitting, they think driver, they think irons, and we, putter is, is just as important, if not more important. We neglect the putter because it's the club that we're only swinging five, six miles an hour. Yeah. You know, we, we look at the driver, it's you're going gangbusters, 100 plus, a putter, it's slow, how yeah. much does it matter? It's a ton. Yeah. You know, I, I, I tell pretty much every customer I have, an inch is a mile, two degrees is a trip to the moon. You get things dialed in and they, they, get, they get excited quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, clearly we've all experienced that. You've experienced both as a player and, and your own right, but also with the customers you've worked with. It can make a gigantic difference. Um, I guess I want to leave you with maybe one question and then we'll start to wrap up here. But... Um, for a player out there that might be sort of on the fence about getting fit, they might, you know, see this stuff about how a fitting can make a big impact or how a fitting can, you know, change your game. And but they they think it's kind of almost, you know, for about, lack of a better word, propaganda. Is there anything that you would maybe tell them to kind of uh, if, reassure them that this if is right? you're a beginner, novice, you play once a week or you play five times a week? getting a fitting is the best thing you can do in the game of golf. Mm -hmm. The neat thing here at Second Swing, it's not intimidating. You come in, it's a very relaxed environment. All of our fitters here are all excellent golfers. They've been around the game for a long time. They're schooled, great. Um, it, it, to come in here and spend two hours, most people wish they could spend four hours. That's how good of an experience it is. Mm -hmm. um, and you will see results. Yeah, and that's ultimately that will lead to lower scores, yeah. more fun. You that's know, the goal. You know, look, if you just look at the guy who plays once a month, if you can make it fun for him where he hits one more fairway or he reduces his slice in half, he's going to enjoy himself. Well, now he comes out twice a month. That's, that's a win for the game. There. Win for the game, win for us. You know, yeah. it's 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 a great thing. Exactly, exactly. That's that's a phenomenal way to, to wrap this up. I think um, this was uh, a very fun conversation to look back at your career, but also, yeah. I mean, just speak some truth about club fitting a little bit. And and uh, we will always be a huge proponent of anybody getting fit. It's going to help your game. It's uh, going to help you shoot lower scores. So we recommend that you schedule that fitting. Get with Mike here at the Tour Van in Scottsdale. Uh, Get your putter dialed in and shoot some lower scores, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for the time. Um, some fascinating stories and uh, uh, just a lot of fun to have here. Um, I'm really looking forward to having the viewers and listeners uh, get their hands on this one. Thank you.